so Judy, this is very exciting. Um, um, especially for people, I think, familiar with Brisbane itself. I mean, your evocation of the city during the Second World War is, was absolutely one of the highlights for me. It was so brilliantly rendered, um, quite literally from the opening paragraphs. Um, thank you, Emma. Emma introduced your um, very interesting and varied career, but you can now rightfully call yourself a novelist. Um, so a couple of questions that stem from a conversation we had earlier this morning on the phone. Um, some people may know this, others may not, but you said you come from a very old Queensland-based family that stretches back to the 1830s. Mm. I'm just interested in that. Could you just tell me a little bit about that? Oh, my God, can I? My sister yeah. does much better than I do. But my grandfather's family were connected to the Zillmans, who were the early um, settlers at Nunda, the German um, settlement there. And uh, on my mother's side, um, well, the, the most interesting thing, I suppose, is that both my great uncles on either side, between them, built Brisbane. One was Lang Powell, who did Tattersalls and, you know, various other things. The other was George Prentice, who did the town hall and all the rest. So, wow. they, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I didn't know that until I started working in Cultural Heritage Branch. I mean, I'd heard about them, but I had no idea but they were quite influential in their time, yeah. Well, so you've got your fingerprints all over Brisbane going yeah. way back. Mm -hmm. um, the book, The Brisbane Line, is dedicated to your mum, mm. Libby. Mm. You, you write in the dedication, which has intrigued me, and I want you to explain it, uh, quote, to Libby, who remembered the Americans making a line. Tell us the story behind that. Okay. Um, mum was at school and then at university during the war. And I often asked her, you know, when I was doing this for the background information, she'd tell me various things. But I always remember one day she said she was walking down George Street on the way to the university where she was studying pharmacy and she stopped to have a cup of tea or coffee or something. An American, you know, obviously sat down and was making a line. Well, I had never heard that expression before, you see. And the thing about the Brisbane line is that I didn't, um, I mean, it's a term that lots of people know. It's a story that many people know. But I wanted this book to be about lots of lines. Uh, there are lines that people cross, the lines that people shouldn't cross, the parallel lines of, of, of Brisbane, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so anyway, I, I like that expression um, because getting the language of the time is not always easy. Mm. So making a line was chasing someone up and, you know, trying to, yeah. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the tram lines of Brisbane too. There's a wonderful quote in the book about Brisbane society, which we'll come to. But did, did your, did, do you remember as a young person um, stories from your mother about, about the Amer so-called American occupation no. during no. that period? No. So no. what got you? What got you interested? We'll talk about um, Irvin Task shortly. But what got you? Had you always been interested in this particular period um, of Brisbane history? Not particularly. Although my aunt, my mother's sister, um, she worked for Naval Signals during the war, and um, and I had heard, but not until I was an adult. Um, she was the operator who received the message um, that the Centaur had been bombed. Um, so I guess I'd heard those sorts of stories, um, but no, not particularly. No, it wasn't. It wasn't an era that I knew that much about. Um, I've had to learn a lot. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I think we were discussing. It's been six um, jam-packed years that you've spent on this project. Well, not fully, but. Um, I wrote this biography and then I was looking for another project and I had thought of doing a biographical work and I was interested in Ernestine Hill actually. And I went to the Fry Library and was looking at her papers. Sadly, they're all in bloody shorthand, so almost no one can read them. But anyway, um, and I, these files were there. It's a long story begins with my cousin, moves through my sister and then to me. But these were the files kept by an American military policeman who was based in the South Brisbane Town Hall. And I'm sure he wasn't supposed to keep these files. Most of them are carbon copies. 
and um, and he stayed in Australia and the files stayed with him and he handed them to my cousin and eventually they ended up with me. They're now in the State Library um, and uh, they're a fascinating insight into the period, I guess. Mm. Okay, let's let's um let's um clarify this story because it's a it's a really important story in general, but it's a very important story in relation to your novel. So we've got a gentleman by the name of Irvin Albert Task out of Collingswood, New Jersey, in the United States, and Task was sent to Brisbane during um the Second World War. Tell us about Ir Irvin Task and his job. And then we can talk about how you, you managed to acquire or see his papers. Well, he worked for the Criminal Investigation Commission and that was um, run by the Provost Marshal. Um, the thing to remember is that just because a war is on, crime doesn't stop. And um, soldiers are subject to military law. And so there needs to be uh, an investigative branch that will look into crimes committed by and on soldiers. Um, and I'll come to this again, but, but it, it, that interplay between the Queensland legal court system and the American system is really fundamental, I think, to a lot of what happened in Queensland, or well, Australia generally. Um, so these files, they're just case files, you know, so it's, you know, a brawl in Spring Hill and, you know, three people knifed and his notes and his photographs and, you know, scene shots, um, descriptions of, of the scene. But I never really investigated him. Yeah. The thing was that the, the most striking was a murder, which is, forms the basis of this. And, and what was interesting about that was that the murder was of an American soldier and it was investigated by the Queensland Police and the investigating detective was Frank Bischoff. And that's what grabbed me because I thought that was a story that I wanted to investigate. But when I decided that really I wanted to write a novel, I was not going to write, you know, a history of Brisbane in World War II. And that would be boring as batshit in my view. Um, <laughs> So I thought a crime novel would be a way to tackle it. Um, so I really didn't want to know about Urban Task because I wanted to create a character and not be bound by the real person. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that, that character would be, become Joe Washington. But um, in terms of Task, his job, was it not, was to, um, his responsibility was to investigate crimes committed by or against um, the American soldiers that were in Brisbane. And he would prepare reports for the military courts, okay? Because what you've got to understand is that um, soldiers are always um, subject to military law, uh, but they're also response subject to, well, no, when a crime was committed in Queensland, um, the Queensland police were involved in investigating that crime. Uh, because if someone was murdered or raped or whatever, there was no knowledge of who the perpetrator was. And so the investigation was done by the Queensland Police. But an agreement that existed between the Government of Australia and the Government of the United States, and which always exists when there are military occupying forces, is that if the perpetrator is a soldier, they are handed over to the military courts. And so... Task worked in parallel in many ways with the Queensland Police. But if perpetrators were American, they were handed over to the American courts and they were, um, they were judged according to military law. And that's interesting because there's a quite famous case of a, of a guy who raped a, a prostitute um, and murdered her. And uh, he was sentenced to hang by the American military courts. But, of course, Queensland had no capital punishment. So they had to fly him to Papua New Guinea to hang him. Incredible. So um, where, where the real-life scenario gets tricky, and you've you, utilised it beautifully for your book because it provides so much tension, and we'll talk in depth about Frank Bischoff shortly, but you have poor old Urban Task over in that beautiful building in South Brisbane, compiling his little reports, his meticulous typing away, 
um, a terrific investigator, as evidenced by the documents which are now available to everybody in the State Library of Queensland. And you have him intersecting with one of the most corrupt and vile um, Queensland police officers in its history in Francis Eric Bischoff. So um, it wasn't a great, great task came up against um, a lot of things, didn't he? Yes. I would say, though, I don't believe that at this point, Bischoff was quite the Bischoff he became. Yeah. Uh, and my theory is that, I mean, there's, there's different sorts of police corruption. There's the corruption that begins at, as the sort of, you know, free hamburger on the way home, which becomes the, you know, carton of beer after hours, which becomes et cetera, et cetera. But there's another form of corruption that occurs when I think police are frustrated because they believe someone is guilty of a crime and they can't get the evidence and they can't prove them and they can't convict them. And that's where you end up with the verbaling and the so forth. And I think what happened in World War II was that detectives were in this appalling position where they were investigating crimes, arresting people, and then sending them off to another jurisdiction, a military court that very often didn't take the cases seriously. I mean, the, the main game was the war. They wanted people back, uh, that, that, you know, they did clearly when they were very serious offences um, take action, but often it was pretty minor. And so I think, I, I just think the police became, um, cynical. Mm. And, and the task papers too, I mean, um, as you've indicated to me earlier today about why you chose to do crime fiction, because it can penetrate layers of society in a way that other genres can't, and we'll get to that. But the task papers are fascinating in that they're inadvertently a record of what was going on in the suburbs and the city and the suburbs of Brisbane at the time. So there's great anecdotes oh. about uh, people having parties with American um, soldiers and sailors and complaining about the noise and 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 there's young young women going down and having sex with um with servicemen in the botanical gardens and and disputes between people and, and of course as you um, indicated there was murder now the interesting thing about the murder in your book is that it was an american serviceman murdered by a queenslander a civilian and that's why um, this is an interesting case because this went to the Queensland courts. Now, it actually went to the Queensland courts very quickly and I'm not going to tell you all the details of what happened because, you know, they're not as in my book, but um, that, that puts a different complexion on this case in many ways. Mm. Yeah. And, and also with the task papers, you know, every generation thinks that it it's reinvents the wheel in terms of being risque. I mean, Brisbane during the 1940s in wartime, there was sex everywhere. Was there not Judy yeah. Powell? It was, it was just on fire, Brisbane. Well, um, I said to you earlier today, uh, my aunt um, was great friends with Betty Churcher, um, who ran the National Gallery. And Betty Churcher is quoted in William Hathrell's book about the 1950s in Brisbane. Um, she said, in the 1950s, Brisbane was like a rock pool where the tide had gone out. And I was interested in what Brisbane was like when the tide was in. And the tide was really in. And um, the, the numbers of people who went through Brisbane is phenomenal. I mean, nobody's got entirely accurate figures. But it wasn't just the overpaid over here and, you know, um, oversexed, oversexed, overpaid and over here. It was that um, music was transformed. You know, Artie Shaw was here. You know, um, all sorts of um, art flourished. Uh, yeah. Because you, and in fact, I've heard someone say that even in terms of jazz, uh, American musicians who would not normally have met in America met in Brisbane. And so there was this incredible um, cross fertilization um, because you had a whole lot of people young uh, thrown together in circumstances that were unusual, yeah. 
let me just jump to a quote from your book uh, that applies to um, um, the, the, the rock pool. Mm -hmm. And um, this is Joe Washington, our hero, um, making an observation um, near the beginning of the book. And he says, in the 18 months since he'd landed, he'd seen Brisbane change. Long gone were the young women in wide fairy floss skirts and bouffant sleeves curtsying to the governor as they made their debut at the Masonic Ball. Now the dance floor heaved with soldiers and sailors, gyrating young women shimmering in slinky material, all of it sliding over non-girdled flesh. <laughs> I love that non-girdled flesh, Judy. So yeah, it was a transformation, wasn't it? It was. It was a brief time, but it was, uh a very exciting time and to be and for many people it was a disturbing time because all the old certainties were gone but if you were young and um, there was great opportunity and promise um, and there was money to be made. <laughs> Absolutely now now um, Irvin Task ended up settling in Australia in fact he had a house at uh, Brookfield mm. um, a conspicuous pink home with um, with large American-sized bathrooms and so on and so forth. And um, to follow up on your great work, I did a feature story some years ago on Task and tracked down two of his, his two children who live actually on the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. And they remembered as children, um, um, quietly, without dad knowing, leafing through some of his um, documents and, you know, and I love stories like this. Those documents ultimately ended up in your hands and then ended up in the State Library of Queensland. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Quite extraordinary. So you didn't want to know the details, though, of Task's life because you wanted, and speak to me as a fiction writer here, you didn't want to, um, how can I say it, constrict the creation of Joe Washington. No, I didn't. I didn't want to know about him. Uh, I mean, research is, can be a bit of a trap. I mean, I'm easily trapped by it. And I'm, I've never written a novel before. So I'm, you know, I'm not by nature a storyteller, perhaps. Um, so I had to, uh, I had to create characters. I wanted to create characters. I was happy to use historical characters, Frank Bischoff, Judith Wright, Theo, you know, these people, I wanted them to to be part of the background, but I wanted to create the main characters. And um, um, one of the reasons why I chose crime, I think, uh, and one of the reasons why I wanted, I mean, obviously this was about a murder, but why I wanted a detective. Um, detectives can occupy different layers within a society, okay? And I didn't just want to tell the story of Brisbane crime. That's not my bag at all. I wanted to tell the other stories of events that were happening in Brisbane. And so a detective who was also interested in photography, a detective who was interested in music, a detective who, um, you know, was invited to literary salons and stuff like that, gave me the opportunity to do that. So I didn't really want to know much about Irvin. Yes, but there, there must have been something about that a task-like figure. I mean, even in the, your novel, Joe Washington says that here he is at the bottom of the world writing reports that nobody's going to read. So, but you must have seen some form of potential in a task-like figure as, as well as someone like larger than life like Frank Bischoff. Oh, uh, well, one of the things is, of course, he's an outsider and mm. that's useful. Um, I mean, the thing about you know, the classic detectives, you know, there's something about them, you know, they're a drunk or a womaniser or a this or a they're deaf or that there's got to be something. It's hard, <laughs> it's hard when it's a military person because A, he's got to be moderately fit and B, he's got to be young. Um, so you can't have a lot of those things. But to me, having an American, an outsider, who was investigating things, uh, it gave me the opportunity to observe things and to... Um, see the clash where it happened of um, different sensibilities. Okay. Yeah. yeah and, and I think too, it were, and 
agree with me or not, it, I think it works incredibly well too to have an outsider describing things that we take for granted, describing the Brisbane River, describing certain buildings. So you've got this fresh take everywhere throughout the novel on these iconic um, Brisbane places and buildings and landscapes that, um, uh, that from an outsider's viewpoint through their eyes worked incredibly well. Mm. Did you find that? I mean, he is, a, he is a photographer and there's a lovely way that he looks at light and he's always considering colour and um, it gave yeah. a beautiful depth. I mean, it, 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 someone who lives in a city um, sees things in a totally different way. Um, and for, I mean, for some Americans, for some small town Americans, Brisbane is a big city, you know. Mm. We all assume that all the Americans were, in fact, from big cities, which they weren't. Um, but, yes, yeah, so you, you know, you're sent to, I mean, well, maybe not now. We might, none of us ever travel again, but we're used to a world where people travel. Uh, the 1940s was not a world when people flitted across the world. So to be sent halfway across the globe to a completely different place where people might speak the same language, but I got it wasn't always easy to understand. Um, and, you know, people ate different things. People, you know, they, there's a wonderful little book, which I'm sure you've seen and others have seen. The American Army put out a guide to Australia for American soldiers and it was published in 1942. It's brilliant. It's great, actually, and it's very clever. Um, but it's really interesting. I mean, all the things that were different. Americans ate, or in those days they ate, lots of fruit and, you know, milk and, you know, all all the Australians ate was potatoes and mutton. It was revolting. And, you know, I mean, all these differences. The Americans loved ice cream, you know. Yes. Yes. And, I mean, just... Sometimes those things become important, like toilet paper. You know, people focus on these funny things, particularly when there's rationing. rationing. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, for you, um, Judy, as a writer, to dive into the novel... Hmm. What were the challenges for you? Did it, I mean, did it, did it take time for you to understand um, actually the freedoms um, that fiction can give you? Did you feel um, un, un, unlocked a, as a writer, given it was your first adventure into fiction? Well, um, yes, it was hard to unlock myself, probably. Um, you know, I'm not used to being like that. I'm, and it's why, you know, I have those historical notes at the end because I have played around with the truth, but I think I'm enough of a historian. I think I should tell people that. Um, but, yes, so it, it took time to um, relax into a story. Um, every, most of the events in there come from something that happened. Uh, but I played with how I put them together and, and interlocked them. Mm. Uh, and hopefully it worked. I don't know. Yeah, it works beautifully. Um, why crime fiction? Do you read a lot of it? I like crime fiction. I think crime fiction's great. I think, um, I think um, time and place is done best, better by crime fiction than anything else, you know? I, I love Philip Kerr's books, you know, Bernie Gunther in World War II. I mean, he's working for the Nazis, for God's sake. I mean, Frank Bischoff's got nothing on them. And, um, you know, I'm just reading Adrian McKinty on the, and he's got a detective and it's in Belfast during the Troubles. And think of Ian Rankin's Rebus and, you know, Donna Leon's Brunetti and, you know, all these characters. Um, you get a sense of a place so much better somehow. I don't know why it is. I think it is this layering. The fact that a detective has to be an observer, has to be um, walking into different areas of society and watching. Um, yeah, I, I think crime fiction does it really well. Peter Carey's Sydney, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, you told me too earlier today that um, only, only with the novel could you get the layers that you needed. Hmm. Can, you, can you talk about that? Um, well, I suppose, um, well, if I were to just simply write a book about Brisbane in World War II, and it's been done, 
by better historians than me. Um, you know, how would you get those descriptions of the Brisbane River? How would you, you know, I mean, um, you could do it, uh, but it wouldn't necessarily be alive, it seems to me. And by having characters walk through that world, yeah. um, you're not looking back on something. I mean, one of the things that's hard about writing history, it seems to me, nobody knows how the world will end. I mean, we don't know whether this that we are living through now, you know, will last for six months or six years. And um, people who were living in the lead up to the war didn't know they were living in the lead up to the war, you know? Um, so there's a kind of immediacy about characters in a novel who are living through a period of time. And we understand, because we've got the hindsight, we know what happened. We know Frank Bischoff was a crook. Yeah. Joe didn't. You know, he knew he was a detective who kind of, you know, crossed the line occasionally. Mm. Okay, well, let's let's go to a couple of those darker themes that, that run through the novel. Um, tell us about the black market in Brisbane during that period. Oh, it was everywhere. You know, there was money to be made. And so, well, there was rationing. Uh, and not only was... Uh, were goods rationed, but um, often you could make more money. So you could, uh, for example, booze. Booze in pubs was rationed, but you could make more money selling the booze to the Yanks. So why wouldn't you do that? So that just made things even more restricted. Um, I was interested, Judith Wright at that stage lived in New Farm, um, the house is still there, actually, on New Farm Park. And, and she rented a room from a taxi driver. And she said, it's interesting how they were always tinned food. They never were short of anything, you know, because taxi drivers um, were part of that, I think, because they were in a position to move thing, people and goods and so forth around. Um, yeah, there was, there was money to be made. Um, and the Yanks had it. Money. Yes. And, and there's a fascinating sort of subplot in your novel about um, a black market in fuel. But um, there was the, the legendary stories of the, the brothels in Albert Street in Montague Road and um, the soldiers lining up around the block, and um, uh, even though it was illegal in Queensland at the time. Um, yeah, there was, in fact, a doctor who worked um, at the Lockhoffs Hospital who would check... Yeah prostitutes every week so it was an accepted thing and yes. my reference to rubber at the very beginning is a play on condoms because they were handed yes. out big time by the uh, armed forces yeah so it was an accepted thing yes and and, and the other dark uh, sh the shadow that looms over this book of course is frank bischoff mm. um tell i know you're fascinated with bischoff and we've had some terrific discussions about bischoff I would love to know what he would think f featuring um, in full Technicolor in a novel. I don't, I don't think he could ever have conceptualised that. Mm. It's wonderful. But, um, you know, Bischoff was born in um, out, just outside of Toowoomba, um, spent some of his younger constabulary years in Ipswich. Mm. And, um, and then, of course, he's the big fella and looming larger than life in Brisbane. So tell us about your fascination with Bischoff and why he makes a great character and what you think of him now that you've done all that research. Well, I, I mean, I couldn't say I know that much about Frank Bischoff. I mean, he's a, he, he's, he's a real character, but he's fictionalised, really. Um, and I think at the period which I'm writing about, I think he was really only beginning, okay? I think the war gave them all opportunity. Um, and he was, at that point, he was a senior sergeant in charge. There were about five or six um, uh, units at the CIB and he was in charge of the one that was to do with murder and so forth. Um, yeah, I... Well, I suppose... Hmm, what do I think about Bischoff? Not enough has been done about Bischoff. Nobody quite knows, you know. Actually, Bischoff and Her Ashley Herbert, this is a complete side thing. 
Herbert's the real one, I reckon. He got away with it. And okay. he got away with it as well. Mm. Um, so you 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 mentioned this to me quite a while ago, and it's never left left my mind. It, I'm just so intrigued by it, and I'm convinced that you're right. In that, during the period of, in which you set the novel, uh, with Bischoff wandering around, um, I, I'm paraphrasing you, but the the theory is that he really fine tuned elements of his um, corrupt behaviour during this specific period. Um, and 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 noticed opportunities and worked out how to make a quid and and then that um blew out of course um only i think 15 years after this novel is set when he becomes the queensland police commissioner but um i think there's a, there there's indications that uh he's connected to the brothels um there's certainly um there were queries about the Santoy brothel in Montague Street, which I mentioned. And in fact, they lost their license. They were fined at one stage. And I remember in the, in the um, papers, it says that's interesting that they were fined because they were the only ones who'd been raided and there were many others. So it's always seemed to me they, would, they just weren't paying the money. And so um, they, got, um, they got raided. Um, I don't know how corrupt he was. I think he, at, at this point, I think, um, as I say, I think there was a frustration that they couldn't get convictions for crimes that they knew were happening, um, and I think that's a that's a real that's a real um, cause of of corruption. Yeah, I, I'm I'm probably wrong here, but I'm just um, guessing. But it's something in this area that Bischoff claimed. I think that his um, success, his conviction rate for murder, by mm -hmm. the end of his career, I think was 52 successes out of 53, and the only one he couldn't solve was Betty Shanks. I don't think. Oh, I reckon it's this one. I'm afraid because 32 out of 33 convictions, but no one was ever charged with the Betty Shanks murder. So it's not solving, it's convictions. And you see, police want convictions. Mm -hmm. And that's what they couldn't get with the Americans because uh, all the, all the um, perpetrators were handed over to military courts. Mm. Um, but, but parallel, again, it's lines, as you were discussing earlier, the lines and the intersection of lines through this novel. Um, parallel to this darker story with Bischoff and the murder and the body found in the Dutton Park Cemetery is this wonderful evocation of, of the, the um, beginnings of this Bohemia in Brisbane with oh. Judith Wright, Thea Astley, Clem and Nina Christensen, oh. um, poets, painters. Oh. And it's a beautiful juxtaposition of what else was happening in Brisbane in this very intense period of history. And that's why a novel a novel can do that. Um, and the character Rose, who I created, is the link between those. Um, and because it was, it was. And uh, I think there's a passage I I wrote somewhere where I said Brisbane uh, Brisbane society moved on parallel lines like the lines of a tramway. Yes. So one line went through, and, you know, and these lines never crossed. So people who were sitting in the Lyceum Club listening to a discussion about surrealist art had no idea that next door in the pub uh, were black market dealings occurring because these communities um, moved beside each other without ever crossing over. So I wanted a character who would cross over. Yeah, and what is it do you think about, like I think back to the 1970s under the Bjorki Peterson regime, and, you know, un, in a period of that, that great tension emerged great art, great music, great um, um, writers. And in, in wartime, you've got, wandering through your novel, beautiful um, Judith Wright and Thea and, um, and the blossoming, like, it's like roses rising out of the ashes. Mm. Is, is, that, is that a cycle in history or what do you think? Oh my God, I don't know. I suppose when people are put under pressure, um, I'm not sure how much pressure Brisbane was under though. I mean, really, I think, you know, there was 
a serious time. I set this in 43. 42 was the lead up to the Battle of Brisbane and um, things were tense. And in 42, um, you had, you know, um, enormous casualties in Papua New Guinea and the Middle East and so forth. By 43, people are a bit over it, fed up, fed up with the Yanks, want it all finished. Um, of course, there was a uh, tragedy because of the war, but um, Michael Duffy's written a book about um, World War Noir. It's about the Sydney underworld, really. But he makes the point that actually only a minority of people who were in the armed forces ever saw active service. Um, you know, there was this huge logistical support. So there were people servicing submarines and people servicing planes and people driving, you know, um, transports around. So, I mean, lots of people didn't leave Australia. Uh, lots of people who did leave Australia never went to the front. But um, there was just this... I mean, people were thrown out of their comfort zone. You know, mm. so huge numbers of predominantly young um, people thrown into new circumstances, new situations. Um, that can be a creative time. Who knows what will come out of this, but things will, you know? Mm. I just want to return to that uh, stunning quote in your book about the, the uh, parallel tram lines mm. that, that ran through Brisbane, one line flowing through the cat houses and saloons of South Brisbane, and another traversing the genteel suburbs of Ascot and Tawong. And you write, the parallel lines of Brisbane seldom crossed. Joe wondered what would happen if they did. I'm mm. wondering how much Brisbane has changed, Judy. Oh, I, well, I think that's, the, I think those parallel lines exist everywhere, don't they? You know, we all inhabit a particular world and we rarely cross into another world. Um, we, we are in our, and maybe that's where the creativity comes in times of stress, because people are thrown into circumstances they wouldn't normally put themselves in. And they're suddenly, they're meeting different people, confronted with different problems that can bring up all sorts of um, creative things. Um, but yes, you know, I wonder how much we ever really know about what goes on in the street next door. Yeah, that's right. Um, what I love too about the book, and I know people certainly familiar with Brisbane and in, with an interest in Brisbane history, is um, the recreation of places like the Trocadero and the Blue Moon Skating Rink. And it made me, in a way, nostalgic, which is not new, um, that these iconic places are lost to time. I mean, MacArthur's office is still there. Um, but has, is it more difficult to imagine historical Brisbane given we've lost so much? We have, but it's amazing what's there still, you know. Um, and you can wander around. And I mean, the PX where the Battle of Brisbane was, that's still there. You know, I mean, there are places that you can see. Much of the South Side's, of course, been completely changed and transformed. Um, and we've lost, you know, of course, the Cloudlands and the Bellevues and so forth. But there is... A, but I, you know, I worked in cultural heritage branch, so we, and I promoted the protection of cultural heritage in Queensland, but I don't believe in things in aspic. I don't, you know, I like the layers. I like the levels. I like being able to wander around and see um, that there's a bit of the 1940s and beside a bit of the 1890s and a bit of, you know, something modern. I don't think ha nothing should be set in, in amber, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But we, there is quite a bit to see if you look. Mm. Uh, well, the question of looking is really interesting. We were talking today about your mum in, in her era, you know, walking, walking, mm. walking to get to places in the city where she had to be. Mm. And um, you, indeed, um, walking the streets of Brisbane as part of your research for your book. Tell me about walking and also about how once you know about a place in the city, you can never really look at it in the same way again with that knowledge? Um, the walking, I mean, you know, people didn't have cars. People weren't as um, affluent, really. I mean, they may have had a car, but certainly there were no, you know, 
two and three car families, um, there, the, the city was so much smaller physically too. So the tramways, the terminuses were the extent of the city, basically. Um, and, and people would walk long distances. Um, Mum said she, she lived in Turinga, she'd walk in to have a piano lesson somewhere near the regatta and then she'd walk down George Street to the university. You know, that's no mean feat, that walk. Um, I think you learn a lot by walking a city, you know. Yes. I think we all should do more of it. Maybe um, now is the time to um, investigate your own little community. Mm. Fantastic suggestion. Now, at the, the end of the book, Judy, there's the slightest hint that Joe and Rose might see each other again. Now, I'm not suggesting I'm to put you to work, um, Judy Powell, but I see a sequel. I see Joe, like Task, settling in Australia. I see this 1950s drama unfolding with the back backdrop of Bischoff's real rise to power. You're not interested in that, are you? I can tell. Well, it's kind of interesting because my husband just brought me a glass of champagne and I, I have always planned three books, right? 1943, 44, 45. And Peter tells me that I, he should, that Joe should end up working for the Queensland police, bitter and twisted and cynical um, against the odds. But I'm not sure I'll get that far. But I will try and at least do another one. <laughs> well, who knows after another glass of champagne, hey? Um, <laughs> What, what, what I got excited about, too, when I finished your book was that it's been quite literally 77 years since the, um, the October, the month you describe um, during the war in Brisbane. And your book gave me the a feeling that there are still stories emerging in, in books like your book. There are still stories around that have, have yet to be told. Oh, God, yeah. Lots. Hmm. Lots. Actually, I have to tell you one story because this man sadly passed away at the end of last year. But um, the body that is found in the South Brisbane Cemetery uh, at the beginning of this book is based on a real murder. And in the task files, you will have seen the body because there's a photograph of the body. And um, and this man was a, an intern at the General Hospital and was present at that person's autopsy. Oh, and my God. I thought, that's extraordinary. Yeah, that was Dan Hart. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there are still people around. Um, and there's lots, of, there's lots of stories. There's always stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, I think we're going to go to questions. Uh -huh. We'd love some questions from your fans out there, even though we can't see them all. Um, before we get to that, congratulations, Judy, on a fantastic uh, book. It's a wonderful novel. I hope you keep writing novels. Um, and uh, I want to thank Avid Reader. If, if people haven't got your book, I'm imploring them, um, whether you get it online or whatever, but through, I think, Australia's best independent bookstore, and that's our very own Avid Reader. So um, please get a hold of it. But um, I'm, I'm relying on um, Emma, our moderator, to deliver any questions that anyone out there in the world might have for Judy. Yeah, so we've got a few, Judy. Um, the first is from Annie Webster, and he says, Hi, Judy, fascinating book. I'd love to see a story essay on the fascinating historical background, as Matt has done, for example, in the Weekend Australian magazine. Any plans? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> I, I did write something for Griffith Review, I must admit, which they didn't publish. Um, yeah, I, mean, I could. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a lot of interesting historical research that I did. Um, none of it, you know, uh, difficult. My, I mean, now that we've all got access to Trove and, I mean, there's this most amazing resources out there. Um, Peter Dunn, I think, is here tonight. Um, his website, Oz at War, is just, you know, the best. Um, and he was good enough to check my manuscript for errors, so all the errors are mine. 
um, yeah, there's interesting research involved. Not sure if I answered that. Um, the next question that I have is from um, Shelley Baird. Shelley says, of all the historical information you included in your novel, what was the hardest to get right or to confirm? Um, I, I was at an avid thing on Monday and Melanie Myers was there. Melanie's also written about World War II and she talked about the problem of language. And, and it is it is an issue um, because, of course, uh, the terminology that's used about Aborigines or you know, Black Americans is terminology which is not acceptable now, same as the terminology about women, of course. Um, but you've got to be true to the period. So that becomes a tricky, uh, a tricky thing. I wrote a, a, an, an article for the Queensland Writers' Centre and I said this, I said, you know, it's difficult, you, you can't use words, but they were correct at the time and um, they wouldn't use the words that I said. I mean, so that can be tricky, um, getting the language right. Mm. Um, I have another question from Jenny. Jenny asks, have you been approached for a movie and would you be interested in writing the script if it does happen? Oh, it's got to be a TV series. Got to be a TV series. That would be very hard these days because Brisbane is, as Matt says, so transformed. So finding, as I wander around Brisbane, I always think, oh, yeah, that would make a scene. I could do that there. Mm. Make a good series. It'd be fantastic. TV. I thought of a TV series as I was reading it, to be honest with you. Yeah, it'd work really well. Mm. So I've got um, a bit of a comment and a question from Jonathan Smith. Jonathan, Jonathan says, um, hello, Judy. I'm the son of Alan Smith, who was a police constable. And during the war, he founded the pub and brothel beat of South Brisbane. Uh, Dad would never talk of his experiences, but let slip once that he pulled the body of an American Marine from the Brisbane River with a combat knife between his shoulder blades. I believe Dad said the man was black. Dad's father was, a, was Inspector Tom Smith, who was very well respected in the Charleville area and worked with Constable Frank Bischoff during the 1930s. I don't know what my grandfather thought of Frank, but I do know Dad would mutter about Bischoff and Terry Lewis, who later became police commissioner and did 10 years convicted of official corruption about the bribes and corruption of these officers. I'm just wondering if you came across my dad or grandfather in your research. I don't. Right. Alan Smith. But um, I was looking at task files and they are the American military police. If you go to Queensland State Archives, there are enormous files there which deal with crimes in uh, Queensland, but written from the Queensland police point of view. So that may well, I don't know that story. I wish I'd come across that story. That would have been good. Was that Jonathan Smith, did you say, uh, did made that comment? Yes, yes it was. And um, his have father- contact you. Jonathan, I'd love to talk to you. Oh. Mm. I, can, I, mean, uh, I can put you in touch if you like. The whole black American story is another story. I've alluded to it in my book, um, but, I've, it's not been dealt with properly, I think, because certainly they were treated much worse by the, by the military courts. Um, Yorick should be out there somewhere. He knows all this much better than I do. Um, we've got time for a couple more, if that's all right with you both. Um, the next question's from Emily McGuire. Emily says, hi, Judy. Can you talk a bit about Rose and Alma and the ways in which women were involved in or affected by the corruption and general upheaval of the time? That's M, is it? G'day, yes. how are you, M? Um, yes, I mean, I think the, the situation for women uh, was very mixed. There was some, in some ways, um, if you, I mean, you could work. Um, a lot of women worked in the war who hadn't worked before. And not only did they work, they therefore had their own income. They could, you know, manage their own lives. Um, but there was also dreadful exploitation of women. And we've alluded to the brothels. Um, in the book, I talk about the Lock Hospital. Um, the Lock Hospital was a hospital 
for women who had venereal disease. And venereal disease was a real concern for the military forces. Um, but of course, they weren't prepared to uh, accept that perhaps venereal disease might be spread by men. It had to be spread by women. And in particular, uh, the women who weren't in control uh, by the brothel owners. So um, it, it's shocking to read really about the way in, I mean, block hospitals existed for a whole range of things. A lot of um, people were locked up if they had transmittable diseases um, like uh, leprosy and there were lock hospitals that um, locked away Aboriginal people. Um, but the, the lock hospitals for women uh, with venereal disease is a, is a really interesting and shocking story. Um, yeah. Um, I have time for a couple more, hopefully. Um, the, this one's from Fiona. Fiona is here, um, our Fiona Steger, and she asks, um, what were you most surprised with in your research? What was I most surprised? Yeah, what were you most surprised to come across? Oh, God. Well, Dan Hart, who saw the dead body, that would have to be my... That was not my uh, research in that sense. That was oral history research. Um, pinpointing something is difficult, I think. Um, the fact that... The fact that they flew someone to Papua New Guinea to hang them, that filled me with astonishment. I couldn't believe that. See, the Americans couldn't imagine that there wasn't capital, capital punishment. But Queensland abolished capital punishment a long, long time ago. Um, so that was, that was pretty shocking. Yeah. Um, I have a question from Nita. Nita says, hello, Judy, from Sweden. Um, you, you did not tell us how you got the notes. It sounds like a story in itself. Oh, well, it is a story. Uh, my cousin, Simon, who may be here, who knows, um, is a filmmaker and he and his first wife, Rosemary, uh, did a film about Brisbane during World War II. And in the course of that work, he interviewed Urban Task. And Urban Task gave him all of these folders of um, case notes. Um, Simon didn't know what to do with them, so he gave them to my sister, who's a historian, and Marion didn't know what to do with them, so she gave them to the Friar Library at the University of Queensland, where I first saw them, and then the university said, look, these are government files, we really shouldn't have them, so they gave them back to me, and then I managed to get State Library to take them. So it's a complicated, but now they're in the best place possible, and anyone here who wants to can go and look at them. Lovely, thank you. Um, I think that that might be all that we have time for now, unfortunately. We do have more questions um, that have kept coming in. Um, but yeah, it is now 7.30, so we will need to conclude, unfortunately. I'm sure that we could all continue talking for hours. Um, thank you so much, Judy and Matthew, for a fantastic conversation tonight. And thank you all for joining us. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful. And so that you can join me in thanking Judy and Matthew, um, I'll now unmute all of you so that we can clap and say thank you. So yeah, thanks again for joining us. And um, it's been lovely seeing you and we hope to see you at more events with us soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Judy, Thank you.